I don't know if we have to say this, but like, also if you want to tweet things about me, that's like excellent. You know, trying to boost my follower count all the time. Um, <laughs> so just to reiterate once again, um, just some trigger warnings for sexual assault and PTSD. And again, like if any of that's going to be overwhelming to you, please, please, please feel free to walk out. Um, <clears throat> So uh, I want to start off by taking you back to the fall of 2016, um, which in technology terms feels pretty much like a lifetime ago. Uh, on their messenger application, Facebook re-released their mobile phone integration and specifically the SMS integration and call log function integration. While this may seem like a pretty unremarkable update and a pretty natural progression to the messenger platform at the time, um, this product update will forever live with me. <clears throat> So as I tapped on the notification about the update, I began to scroll through my messenger application and came across a sec section suggesting people I might want to message. And there from my screen was a face smiling back to me that I hope to never see again, my rapist. Uh, my name's Teresa Stewart, um, and I'm an interaction designer and rape survivor. And after experiencing seeing my rapist based on a Facebook algorithm, I started to think, about, I started to think more critically about what we're automating in social media. So while my current work deals with shipping and fulfillment, I hope to get designers and technologists to think differently about recommendation engines and artificial intelligence, especially as it's laid on in the social sphere. So the person in question was recommended to me because it was somebody who had called me in the past. And the application like, actually said this as the reasons why he was recommended. And so for me, the past, at this point, had been about over a year ago, um, a year since we had spoken, and even a year since his number had even been in my contacts. So Messenger went back through my call logs for the past few years to bring up people I almost forgot, or in this case, tried to forget. And with this recommendation came flashbacks, panic attacks, and a lot of other feelings that are way too overwhelming and emotional for me to even describe without triggering myself into another episode. And all of this happened in the middle of my workday. So I had to suffer silently and appear normal despite what was happening to me. And while this story is specific to me, I can venture to say that this scenario isn't uncommon. Considering one in six American women is the victim of attempted or completed rape, according to the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, also known as RAIN, this has happened to countless victims who might not have been as lucky as I am to have a solid support system to make it through. And this scenario also isn't limited just to victims of rape. Um, while there have been a lot of personal stories shared on Reddit and Twitter of experiences that are similar to mine, this can be an issue for basically anyone. It can range from seeing somebody who bullied you in the past, um, to even a profile of somebody you know who may have passed away in a really traumatic fashion that's triggering to you. So how did all this happen? I mean, Facebook has some of the most talented designers, researchers, and technologists in the world, yet this scenario is unaccounted for. So let's take a look at each part of the experience and see how it failed. First, there was the notification of the feature launch. It wasn't just alerting me that call log and SMS integration was possible. It was letting me know that Messenger had already taken all of my phone information and integrated it into my experience, essentially giving me no choice in the matter. Facebook made the decision that I wanted this as part of my core experience. And how this integration rolled out is pretty similar across a lot of digital experiences, and a lot of designers refer to it as smart defaults, right? Like, think about all the digital products you use in your life, and every time they launch a new feature, think about how much those new features are turned on by default. To a lesser extent, this happened recently um, when Google Assistant rolled out on older Android devi devices. It remapped the entire experience just by default. Second, if there even was an ability to opt in through a permissions modal, what would it have even said? In all the cases, permission dialogues that we write only prepare us for technical specifications and security risks we might face based on the data. There's no preparation for potential personal violation. And lastly, Facebook made the assumption about how I wanted to craft my social circle. Using their algorithm, which again, by all means, should be harmless, Facebook removed my ability to choose who I want to connect with and instead decided it knew better than I did. So looking at these three failures of the experience, what do we do, right? Do we renounce integration of technology and recommendations in social networks? Of course not. Essentially, especially because personal data is pretty big business nowadays, right, with Facebook and other social media. But as designers and technologists, we have a responsibility to create a more empathetic experience around our products, especially as artificial intelligence creeps its way into every facet of our lives. People live whole lives and they bring those experiences to our platforms. And we acknowledge this every day in our products that they're not used in a vacuum, especially when it comes to usability and accessibility settings, but we really think about the trauma that people bring to our products and how we might be causing them to relive those experiences. <clears throat> While I don't have all the answers on how to deal with these situations, we can take small steps in a new direction to be more empathetic. First, 
We must allow users and people to be master of their own domain. This means people should have the ability to opt into new features and integrations, especially where private data is concerned. Turning it on by default is similar to a dark pattern called privacy zuckering, where you're tricked into sharing more personal data than you intended. And for those of you who aren't familiar, a dark pattern um, is defined by darkpatterns.org as a trick used in a website or application that makes you sign up or buy things that you didn't mean to. Um, it's a really great site, and the whole point of it is actually to shame uh, companies that do this and point it out. So I would highly recommend checking it out. Um, second, we also need to warn users of unintended emotional consequences. We must create agreements and permissions that don't just warn us about the technical aspects of a new technology, but also acknowledge the potential for a PTSD trigger. While bringing up these conversations can be difficult, it can be as easy as simply acknowledging that a new feature might bring up unexpected memories or emotions and people should prepare themselves. For example, when Facebook launched that phone integration, they could have simply said, we'll be using your entire call log and this might recommend people in events that could be uncomfortable for you. Third, and this is pretty similar to the first, but we must remember the user knows better than the software. It shouldn't be the goal of your product, especially in the social realm, to make decisions for the user when there are harmful unintended consequences. So these steps are just the beginning, and as designers and technologists, we need to have more conversations about the intersection of trauma and experience design. And in my case, had the product team at Facebook taken even one of these steps during the rollout of phone integration, it could have prepared me and other users for a potential PTSD trigger. Thank you.